We're going to call this meeting to order. Um, this is the February 8th, Wednesday, February 8th, 2023 meeting of the Transportation Committee. We're starting a little after 3 o'clock in room 1100 of the Senate, Minnesota Senate building. Uh, a quorum is not quite yet present, um, but that's okay. We're not going to be voting on anything for a, for a little bit here. Um, I'll declare when a quorum is present. Uh, members. So the agenda today, members, uh, we have seven matters before the committee. Um, we are going to start with uh, presentations on bicycle, pedestrian, and school bus rider safety, um, which will then uh, cue us up for a hearing from uh, on a bill from Senator Morrison. Uh, then we have a number of school bus items, and uh, then we'll wrap with a bill that's um, only got one part that pertains to uh, our committee's jurisdiction but needs to make a stop off here. At that time, we'll have council uh, direct us to those elements that are within the committee's jurisdiction. So we have um, some great people here to present some perspectives on bicyclists, pedestrian, and school bus rider safety. To those who are here to testify on that subject, um, I think there's a list uh, on the printed agenda. If you don't have a copy of that, you can find one in the back of the room. And we have three chairs, and so I'm just going to call everyone up in groups of three, and everyone will have a couple of minutes, two minutes, uh, to, to present your wisdom, thoughts, ideas, et cetera, to us. So with that, we will commence with Ethan Foley from the city of Minneapolis. That We have Jordan Co I'm sorry? Cossack. Kosak, Jordan Kosak, I just met you and already forgot how to say your last name. And, uh, and then Mike Hansen from the Department of Public Safety, please come forward. Mr. Foley, welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Dibble and members of the committee. My name is Ethan Foley. I am the Vision Zero Program Coordinator for the City of Minneapolis, focused on our effort to eliminate traffic deaths and severe injuries on our streets. Thanks for having me today. Uh, when we talk about pedestrian and bicycle safety, um, Director Hansen is going to share similar slides to this. I'm going to let him speak to a little bit of those details. Well, as we talk about stats and numbers, um, I want to just recognize the human impact that is behind these numbers. So these are um, all folks who shouldn't have died. Uh, these are all folks uh, who should still be here with their loved ones. Um, in Minneapolis uh, in 2021, is, the numbers here include uh, these pedestrians who were killed uh, in crashes. Craig, who was 56. Larry, who was 49. Stephen, 62. Kevin, who's 23. Deshaun, who's riding a skateboard, was 16. Sean, 52. Stacy, 42. Sadia, 46. Kelly, 58. Autumn, 18. Rosie, in a wheelchair, was 70. Those deaths are unacceptable. They are preventable. And we've made a lot of progress, but we have a lot more to do. Um, I'll talk about a few of the things we're doing in Minneapolis, and I appreciate your interest in this topic. Um, we, we see in Minneapolis... In addition to the numbers, we see that uh, people walking and people biking are disproportionately impacted by severe and fatal crashes. Uh, everybody should be able to get around safely in our community, in our state, and we, we do need additional care to address these disparities. When we look down at what's going on and what's causing and what's involved in uh, walking and biking crashes in Minneapolis, we see a few things stand out. Um, at intersections is where, in, in an urban environment, most of the bicycle and pedestrian crashes are happening, and that involves a lot of drivers uh, not yielding when turning. Uh, we also see that people do cross mid-block, and that causes some challenges. Certainly red light running, um, and then driver speeding is a big factor. And driver speeding overall is the number one factor in all traffic deaths in Minneapolis and across the state. Uh, when we talk about pedestrian and bicycle safety, it's 
It's extra important because it's always a factor, even if, if there wasn't speeding involved. Speed is a factor because of just physics that we see. And especially when we talk about the speeds regularly in kind of more urban or suburban or small town communities, as we go through the range, the risk to pedestrians or bicyclists uh, grows exponentially from a safety perspective. So speed is so important. And you'll see that reflected in some of the work that we're prioritizing. So and I, our effort, it's sort of our local towards zero deaths effort is called uh, Vision Zero. Uh, similar goal, get to zero, um, traffic deaths and severe injuries. Some of the things that we're prioritizing around safety, and these are for all modes, but for us, pedestrian and bicycle safety is a huge component of overall traffic safety. Um, and so what we're working to do is make proven and proactive safety improvements on our high crash streets. Um, so not waiting for street reconstructions, but getting out there and doing things we know work uh, quickly and efficiently. Uh, we, thanks uh, to support from the legislature a few years ago, we were able to lower speed limits on our city-owned streets uh, in the city. And we're working from that and building on that to also make sure that our street designs support those safe speeds on our streets as well. Um, we are... Uh, working towards having a speed safety camera pilot, which we'll talk a little bit more about in, in a second here, because that relates to the legislature. And then we also recognize, and I think the importance of mostly federal, but also some state work around vehicle safety standards. And just the reality is, is that as cars have gotten bigger, and the impact just to basic physics to a person walking or biking is greater. And so that's a reality that we haven't fully wrestled with as a country yet. Um, so connections to the work at the legislature. I think overall, just being able to support more of those proactive safety investments for communities all across the state is really important. We have state and federal programs around Safe Routes to School, which is great. We've got a, currently uh, the in federal infrastructure bill included a new program called Safe Streets for All, which provides local grant funding. And I see that as an opportunity for communities across the state, but potentially also for the state to work to augment and support uh, those efforts. Um, we also, so I mentioned that we're looking to have a speed safety camera pilot. We hope to be back at this committee uh, soon on that topic because it will require enabling legislation to be able to do. And, um, and while managing, uh, making sure that we can have a fair equitable and efficient uh, program that can de deliver safety results. Um, and then I think it's just important overall just to recognize when we talk about speed limits and other things like this, is really what we're doing is we're prioritizing safety within our transportation work. And at the core, that is really essential if we're going to make progress on this topic. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, thank you. Uh Mr. Fawley, um, I will also mention for the record that Senator, uh, in accordance with the rules of the Senate, the following members will be participating remotely in today's hearing. Senator Coleman from Oconia, Minnesota, and Senator Lang from Olivia, Minnesota. Also a quorum is present. And uh, those who are wondering what the heck, why did Mr. Fawley get to go on for longer than two minutes, the first few speakers here who are setting the stage for us are we're granting a little bit more than a couple minutes, so that's the reason for that. All right, moving on, uh, Mr. Kosak, welcome. Hello, my name is Jordan Kosak. I'm a transportation planner with Hennepin County. I'm also Hennepin County's pedestrian and bicycle coordinator. My presentation is going to touch on three things. Uh, multimodal needs, so that's walking, biking, transit needs. Why do we need these things in our communities? A few of the trends that we're seeing in the data, and then a couple of things that the county has been doing to try to address the identified safety needs. So we've recognized that people need multimodal connections, uh, and that means when I say multimodal, I mean walking, biking, and transit, and it's a way that people can get safely to jobs, work, school, places of worship, and other places in their communities where they, where they live. And um, so having that is a way to um, give people more choice in how they travel and uh, that in a way that's comfortable, safe, and affordable. 
there uh, has been a past of um, disparities in our transportation network where people who cannot or don't want to drive um, have had barriers to transportation. That can be children, the elderly, minority groups, low-income individuals, among others, who have um, uh, had barriers to the way they travel in our communities. And the county has been um, a part of this. You know, many of our roads have created barriers in communities and um, have limited mobility for people. So we're changing our approach and trying to think holistically about our roadways and thinking about the, the needs of people who are traveling in more than just motor vehicles. Um, this this um, chart here shows pedestrian crashes, um, serious and fatal injury crashes in Hennepin County over the past four years. And you can see particularly there's a strong upward trend in serious crashes. Um, fatal crashes have remained um, fairly steady. But in both cases, you know, we find this to be uh, an unacceptable trend at Hennepin County and something that um, in, our, in our infrastructure projects we're working to address. And while this shows just Hennepin County, um, all roadways in Hennepin County, uh, this trend is fairly similar if you would look at Minnesota or the country as a whole. So this is, um, this is something that's happening countrywide. Um, Ethan showed a similar, similar slide, so I won't dwell here too long, um, but just to say that you know, speed really does matter, and that's something that we're thinking a lot um, about in our projects, and along with speed is kinetic energy, so a, a safe systems approach, which is what the FHWA is um, sort of promoting as a way to make our roadways safer, um, you know, looks to how do we redirect that kinetic energy, and a big way is through managing speed, and so this um, you know, a small differential in speed can make a big difference on if a person, a pedestrian, lives or dies in a crash. So Mr. Kosak, can you just spend one more second on that slide, just sure. so that we can bring it home? Thanks. Um, just, yeah, members, just take a look at that. Uh, 20 miles per hour, um, if a pedestrian is hit, one in 10 will result in a fatality versus just 20 miles faster, twice as fast, at 40 miles per hour, eight of 10 people will die in that incident. It's profound, thank you. Hennepin County has adopted a towards zero death program in partnership with the state of Minnesota. And so, you know, I'm in public works and we're really focused on engineering, but what we're trying to do is bring together practitioners, subject matter experts, stakeholders from the other E's of traffic safety. So that includes education, emergency services, enforcement and engagement and collectively have everyone work together on solving this problem using their own expertise and you know, their own, um, own background and um, position that they're coming at the problem from. And it, one way that we do multimodal projects in Hennepin County is we start by making sure that we're prioritizing things the right way. So this graphic just shows that when we are um, using a data-driven approach to score our capital projects, we are including things like safety and equity in how we're prioritizing those projects along with the asset condition of, of the roadway. Um, and this helps us, helps guide us to those um, roadways and corridors where we're seeing a lot of safety issues emerging. The next few slides, I'm just gonna share some recent projects that the county's done, and they just kind of show some examples of uh, infrastructure treatments that we've been using to try to address some of the safety issues that we've seen on our roadway, our roadways. So this first project is Weber 44. This is in North Minneapolis. And this was a full road reconstruction. We um, did streetscape improvements, um, bump outs at intersections. So you can see that in the picture here. There's a parking bay uh, with, a, with a bumped out intersection daylighting intersections, so there were a lot of T intersections where vehicles were parked across the intersection, um, so the bump outs help with that, and then these flashing beacons which um, improved driver yielding compliance. The project also included dedicated bike facilities and uh, was coordinated with Metro Transit's arterial bus rapid transit D-line project where we helped to construct several of the transit stations. So that's something we're doing a lot as well is trying to partner and look for opportunities with transit 
and um, use our roadways as a way to enhance the first and last mile connections to transit. Lindell Avenue in South Minneapolis in the uptown area. This road was experiencing very high crashes for all users and particularly for people walking. If they were trying to cross the road at unsignalized intersections, it was you know, next to impossible. Two lanes of traffic in each direction and you know, very little yielding from drivers and just generally unsafe, uncomfortable conditions. In the summer of 2022, the county piloted a restriping of the corridor to go from four lanes to three lanes. So two lanes in each direction with the center turn lane, as well as, um, as you can see in the picture, these pedestrian refuge islands at the unsignalized crossing with flashing beacon. So the four to three lane conversions, those um, have been shown to reduce crashes by up to 40%. And then um, this two stage, Crossing the pedestrian refuge island with the flashing beacon allows pedestrians to cross just one lane of vehicle traffic at a time and also gets better yielding compliance um, from people driving. The last Mr. project. And Mr. Kosek, if you could, um, we were talking about this a little earlier. I'm, of course, extremely familiar with this stretch. It's very close to where I live. Um, and, uh, you know, people get very, very anxious about these kinds of things in terms of the driver's experience, people using cars in stretches like this, what has been the change for drivers at the peak hour? Yeah, so we've, um, we've done some preliminary analysis after installing this, mm -hmm. and so far we've seen that total corridor travel time for people driving vehicles has only increased by about a minute. And so to us, that's sort of pointing to, because you know, there was a big concern about a lot of congestion and things like that, and it's just not materializing the way that some of the um, initial concerns were were, um, were put out yeah. there. So, so, so members, um, if you heard what Mr. Kosek said, uh, the four to three lane conversion brings accident rates down to by a factor of 40%. Plus, if you look at the photo, um, you can see that people who are not driving up and down the corridor who need to cross back and forth, and this is a very, very uh, busy a couple of neighborhoods that's bound by Lindell Avenue. There are a number of small commercial nodes up and down. A lot of people on foot uh, going back and forth to schools on one side and other kind and housing and other kinds of services and things they need to get to on the other side. I used to actually live even closer uh, to this stretch than I do now. And uh, crossing the street um, at a spot where there was not a stoplight, literally impossible at any hour of the day. Um, so it has improved life immeasurably for a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, and the last project I'll talk about is 66th Street in Richfield. This is another full road reconstruction that we did. Um, we, we did streetscape improvements. We added bike facilities where they weren't existing before, um, as well as a three-lane conversion, crossing improvements, and, and several roundabouts. And we also did some before and after analysis here, and we've had more, more time than the Lindale example, which was just on last year. There's been more than three years of after data to collect. And we found a couple pretty, I think, positive takeaways. One is that we saw um, crashes, all crash types on the corridor dec decrease by 28%. Um, in the after condition, there's not been a single pedestrian or bicyclist crash yet to date, so that's really positive. And then we also saw that um, for people driving, corridor um, travel time actually went up a little bit and congestion actually went down a little bit. So I think this is an example, again, where it shows you can improve safety for all users. You can add pedestrian and bicycle facilities and it doesn't necessarily mean that's gonna be a negative for people who are driving. And then finally, uh, this, this slide just shows um, a number of upcoming projects that we have. And what I want to point out here is that a lot of the work we do is um, funded and we're able to do more work by leveraging federal and state um, grant and, and funding dollars. And so, you know, at the county, we're really excited that um, the Senate and the legislature is considering more money for transportation and um, for pedestrian and bicyclist safety. And um, so, we just want to um, encourage that and you know we we have more that we could do um, if we're able to take advantage of um, of more funding and that's my presentation thank you for having me
Thank you. All right, moving along, we have uh, Mike Hansen and uh, is Ibrahim Adam from the Department of Public Safety. Well, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Mike Hansen. I have the privilege of serving as the director for the Department of Public Safety's Office of Traffic Safety. As you can see briefly from our mission statement, our job is to prevent a lot of the horrible incidents that are the topic of our discussion here today uh, through a variety of uh, policy and research and uh, program areas. And so I'm going to give you, um, there's always a danger going with two very good partners like uh, just testified before me. So you may see some, uh, some of the information repeated, but I'm going to give a little bit maybe higher level view of some of the things that have occurred and then what uh, we've done in response to some of those things. Go ahead, next one. The first slide that we can see here is the bicycle crash tre uh, trends in Minnesota from 2005 through 2022. You can see by the dotted red line that bicycle crashes overall have continued to decline over that period as a uh, proportion of crashes in Minnesota. But the green line is the one that's a little bit more concerning as we take a look at it, and that is the line that tracks the number of fatal and serious injuries sustained as a result of a collision involving a bicyclist. And we can see that that number has been fairly steady until that 2016, 2017 area, and we've been on an upward trend since that time. Some key points to keep in mind uh, that our research section is looking at as far as bicycle crashes. Uh, perhaps uh, somewhat surprisingly, the vast majority of these crashes are occurring in daylight hours between 4 and 7 p.m. And further, the vast majority of these occurred during three months out of the year, June, July, and August, which is probably not surprising given the climate in Minnesota and when most riders are accurate or active out there. You can see also that the primary contributing factor that led to the collision is fairly evenly split between the rider and the motorist. You can see approximately 45% of the time the rider bears the responsibility as a result of failing to yield, fail to obey a traffic sign, or dart or dash into the roadway, and then they're struck. 55% of the time, uh, the uh, critical or causal factor is attributed to the motor vehicle driver as a result of fail to yield, other human factors, which can in include speed, impairment, and vision obscured uh, is also uh, rounding out the numbers there. So we look really at, at three primary things that drive these crash rates. It's speed, alcohol, and distraction. 75% of our bicycle injury and fatal crashes occur within the seven county metro area. And 44% of those occur within one county, and that's Hennepin County. Next slide. Now, pivoting just a little bit, we start to look at pedestrian crashes, another class of what we term vulnerable road users. And you can see that same trend line 2005 through 2022. We see the crashes starting to trend upward slightly, but we also see the number of fatal and serious injuries also starting to trend up. Uh, again, as previous testifiers uh, have stated, that follows uh, the national trend as well as what we're seeing here in Minnesota. Next. Some key points to keep in mind when we're looking at pedestrian crashes. Um, pedestrians and drivers, again, share the, the responsibility for the collisions that occur in the first place. 45% of the time, the pedestrian, because they dart or dash into the roadway, they enter the roadway improperly, they fail to yield to the vehicle where they should, kind of a mid-block crossing or something like that, or visibility um, becomes an issue. We always see a spike in the number of pedestrian uh, injuries and fatalities as we go into those fall uh, uh, days and longer nights where visibility and darkness becomes a bigger problem. Now, when we look at motor vehicle drivers, it's fail to yield, careless or negligent or erratic driving, which would include speed and many of those other uh, uh, violations that are commonly seen out there. Other human factors such as impairment, vision obstruction, and distraction. So those three things are the, what we are trying to focus on. Okay, next one. Again, and uh, not to be completely redundant, but we've seen this slide before. Speed, it all comes down to speed. The human body cannot overcome the law of physics, and physics is a product of energy. And so I'm not gonna belay this, this slide further. You've seen it twice already. Um, I would like to you know, uh, give credit to um, where we're going with uh, how to solve some of these tough issues. 
And in Minnesota, we've called this the, the Towards Zero Deaths program for the last 20 years. This is actually our 20th anniversary. Um, it's now morphing into the next generation of TZD. And this is following a national and actually the international safe system model. And what this does is it pulls all of the stakeholders that you've heard the previous testifiers talk about, brings them all together in a real and a holistic way to solve these tough traffic safety issues. And one of the biggest things that we need to mitigate is that speed, because if we can remove speed and energy from any type of a crash, we're going to reduce the severity. But it also focuses on post-crash care. It, it, it uh, focuses on safe design. It in, uh, focuses on human behavior as well. All of these factors have to be addressed in some way, shape, form, or another in order to make a positive difference. Next slide. Now, I, I'm going to give a lot of credit to my uh, friends and partners at uh, MnDOT. Um, I neglected to say I'm also one of the co-chairs for the Towards Zero Deaths program. I serve with my partner, Brian Sorensen, from MnDOT, and Dr. Mark Kindy from the Department of Health. Um, a couple of more examples uh, of what can be done to mitigate these pedestrian and bicycle issues within communities. The first one I have up here comes to us from Battle Lake, Minnesota. And you can see, again, uh, the before on the left and the after on the right. We're taking a four-lane, undivided roadway with some parking on the street and converting that to basically a two-lane through roadway with turn lanes in the middle, adequate parking, but you're also going to see the advent of those bump outs. And those serve as a traffic calming technique um, or a road diet. We're just taking away some of the ability for drivers to make those mistakes or make those bad decisions that allow them to do the things that lead to those crashes. So in the city of Battle Lake, again, they saw a 19 to 47 percent crash reduction in the total number of crashes after this improvement was uh, implemented. Next one. And from Battle Lake, uh, we'll travel up uh, to Glenwood, Minnesota, which is, again, a similar uh, road diet uh, exercise where a four-lane undivided roadway uh, through an urban area is uh, changed to a three-lane with uh, center turn lanes uh, with the traffic bump outs. And again, the, the separation of the modes of transportation. The vehicles have their lane, the bicyclists have their lane, and the pedestrians have their lane. And all of the studies that we've seen across the world tell us that when you separate those modes of transportation, the overall system becomes much, much safer. So infrastructure is really a key part of what we need to do as we move forward along with that driver behavior and rider behavior and pedestrian behavior that will in turn make the system safer overall. And then finally, when we talk about community engagement and outreach, I'd like to highlight one of the programs that the Office of Traffic Safety conducted with the St. Paul Police Department. This is called the Stop For Me campaign. And it was unique in that it focused on both sides of this equation. It focused on driver behavior as well as the pedestrian behavior. And it was uh, not just an enforcement effort, but it was as much an education and an outreach effort. And it proved to be very successful and very popular with the community because they actually were the ones that led it and that implemented it and worked with the police department and with the, the motorists that were using those roadways in order to make this work. So we've got a couple of pictures that just highlight some of the neighborhood events and the community events that took place as we rolled that out with the St. Paul PD. And then finally, uh, Mr. Chair, I've got two slides uh, dealing with the school bus stop arm. Did you want to have that presentation now or should I hold that for later on in your, your hearing, sir? Yeah, we can hold off on that when we get to the bu school bus. Okay, very good. Uh, that concludes my uh, presentation. I thank the committee for their time. I'd be happy to answer any questions if I can. Great. Questions, members, or for the previous two? Testifiers. All right. So we're going to thank you so much, you. and we'll see you back here in a few minutes. Um, so uh, we're going to actually add someone to the speaking order here, which we had intended to do, um, and someone who can speak from a community experience. Um, Tess Corbismeyer Holman. Sorry, you can stay there, Mr. Grilly. Tess. Uh, Tess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we recently had a tragedy in Minneapolis, which uh, Ms. Corbis meyer holman can speak to. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and then proceed. Um, hi, I'm Tess Holman. I'm a resident of Minneapolis. 
Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Tess Holman and I'm a resident of Minneapolis and on the board of directors of Ms. Holman, can you just lean forward a little bit closer to the mic? Thanks. And I'm on the board of directors of the Hale Page Diamond Lake Community Association. I also work in corporate social responsibility, attend graduate school at the U here in Twin Cities, and am a mother to two young children. I live at the intersection of Cedar Avenue, 52nd Street, and Lake Nokomis Parkway, a gorgeous neighborhood designed for outdoor recreation with extensive bike and pedestrian paths. I purchased my home in large part because of its access to these paths. Minneapolis resident David Norris was killed in a hit and run on the morning of January 13th at the intersection of Lake Nokomis Parkway and Cedar Avenue. No one should go for a morning walk on a designated pedestrian path and end up being fatally hit by a car. As a community board member, I feel it is my duty to advocate for safety at this troublesome intersection. Where Highway 77 turns into Cedar Avenue has long been a problem. There are cars speeding north on 77 as well as entering and exiting Highway 62, all less than half a mile from one of the most popular walking and biking paths in Minneapolis. And that is the intersection where Mr. Norris was killed. Two elementary schools also fall within a half mile radius of that tragic accident. The only existing speed control mechanism from Highway 77 is a radar speed sign, which is insufficient for slowing cars from 55, 60, or more miles per hour to 35 in a matter of seconds. As Highway 62 and Highway 77 are both state highways, I urge this committee to ask MnDOT to consider speed control mechanisms in this area. Rumble strips are proven to reduce driver speed and alert them to changing driver conditions, driving conditions. As a public policy student at the University of Minnesota, I understand the complexities of getting various levels of government to coordinate and mobilize on an issue, and transportation can be especially complex. I hope the Senate overcomes these obstacles before we have another tragedy. My children, neighbors, community, and I thank you for your time. Thank you uh, so much. I really appreciate your coming forward to, to speak to that. Tragedy. So we have Dorian Grilly from the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. If Lewis Moore and Scott Sherman could also make their way to the table. Welcome, Mr. Grilly. Hey, thank you, Chair Dibble uh, and members of the committee. My name is Dorian Grilly. I'm the Executive Director of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. Thank you for inviting all of the active transportation advocates from around the state and metro to speak today. I was gonna have someone speak about trails and mountain biking, but they had to cancel, so I'd like to share a couple comments on their behalf. I'll simply remind you that Minnesota's decades-long investments in state, regional, and community trail systems have been paying ep economic dividends for years. All you have to do is look at places like Lanesboro and Crosby to see the difference these investments have made. Many of our trails in Minnesota have been partially paid for with both state bonds and federal transportation alternatives funds. Thanks to these investments, Minnesota has become a trail state and a national mountain bike destination. There are hundreds of miles of single track mountain bike trails stretching from the Twin Cities to the Iron Range, from Austin and Rochester to the North Shore. Over the past decade, the Minnesota Cycling Association a league, of a, devoted, a league devoted to middle and high school students has created thousands of cycling families who travel across the state to ride. Thanks to the huge economic impacts demonstrated in Crosby and, I and Ironton from the Cuyuna Range's magnetic pull uh, for mountain bikers, communities all across the state have realized that investing in trails will draw mountain biking families. My favorite personal story is one uh, is that one of the surgeons at the Cuyuna Medical Center was found by advertising on the International Mountain Bike website. Uh, so thank you. I look forward to testifying later in the hearing on Senate File 912 and uh, after the rest of the presenters. Great. Thank you, Mr. Grilly. Uh, Mr. Moore, welcome. Thank you. I'm Lewis Moore, president of the Major Taylor Bicycle Club of Minnesota. Um, we are the first and only African-American bike club created in, in the Twin City area. We've been around for 23 years. Uh, we're a group that, that basically emphasizes physical activity for health and wellness. 
And we also emphasize the importance of safety on the road. Um, we have a large group of people who ride. We emphasize helmets. We emphasize, uh, a, you know, going by the rules of the road, um, stopping at stoplights, doing all the things that need to be done. All the things that a lot of people think bicyclists don't do. And I think we're all familiar with that. Um, one of our members was uh, William Dooley, who we recently lost uh, uh, here before Christmas. And he was a member of the club for 23 years and a member of our executive committee. And we were very proud of Bill and what he did. And I'm sure many of you are aware of who he was and what he did here at the, at the state. And, um, you know, we would really like to see his name attached to some sort of legislation uh, that makes people remember who he is. As a club, we have created patches that we're going to be wearing for the very same reason, to have people ask, who he was. Um, bicycling is, is an important part of the community. Um, I'm a retiree from Congressman Martin Sable's office many years ago. Uh, he was the first federal legislator to emphasize cycling in the Twin Cities area, and I was part of many of the organizations like the Minneapolis Bicycle Advisory Board, the uh, State Bicycle Advisory Board, which emphasized those those things and his legislation and his his um, his willingness to to move this forward. Um, I just uh, again want to thank you for allowing me to speak and allowing you, to, you know, allowing me to make sure you understand who we are and what we're about, and we will continue to be a part of the bicycling community in in Minnesota for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moore. Great to see you. Appreciate your thoughts. And uh, the next bill that we're going to hear actually is named for Bill Dooley. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Sher Mayor Sherman. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Sherman. I'm the mayor of Winona, Minnesota. I'm in my going into my third year. We've met. Going into my third year uh, of my first term. Uh, I grew up in Egan. Went to college at Winona State University in 1992. I moved back to Egan in 1995. At that time, I took a job at Eric's Bike Shop. I became a full-time bicycle commuter. I rode for four years. I did not drive a vehicle. I have a car. I had a car, had insurance. The only time I drove was to go to a bicycle race. <laughs> I was one of those people that you see humming around town in Lycra in the middle of the winter, in the heat of the summer. I have ridden my bike well over 100,000 miles in my lifetime. I have also driven as a sales rep in the bicycle industry, which I have worked for 28 years in the bicycle industry. I've driven over a million miles. I've traveled across 17 states covering those territories, seeing how bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure can make a great impact on me as a driver, and also how it can impact the communities that I was working within. Now that I'm mayor in Winona, I look at the things that we have done and the improvements that we can make. I can tell you in my 100,000 miles of bicycle commuting, I have been hit by a vehicle over 20 times. This past fall, I was hit again, simply because a gentleman was on his way and he was late to pick up his daughter. It happens. And it's not necessarily the driver's fault. And it's not necessarily the bicycle rider's fault. Things happen. What I can say is that all the infrastructure pieces that we are looking at here today, what those do is those override the human nature to get there as fast as possible when you're driving a vehicle. Bump outs, lane reductions, speed reductions, these all are pieces that will save lives. It will increase the well-being of our citizens within the state and it will reduce the impact of accidents that do happen for no reason other than they didn't see them. It's important that we look at this type of bill, that we put appropriations towards these types of infrastructure pieces so that we can make sure that not only are we a safer state, but we're a state with more well-being for the people who choose to live here. 
I appreciate your time very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. So I see two people have appeared at the table. Um, this is uh, Will Wislow, Wislow and Angela Olson. Welcome. All right. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is Will Wislow, and I'm the Safe Routes to School Coordinator for Richfield Public Schools. Thank you for the opportunity to share how the Safe Routes to School and active transportation programs are benefiting the city of Richfield and its youth. Richfield is the first ring suburb on the south side of Minneapolis, home to about 37,000 people. And Richfield Public Schools ISD 280 is a small district, at least for the Twin Cities area, serving about 4,200 students. The most impactful part of our Safe Routes programming is the Richfield Community Bicycle Fleet. It includes more than 40 bikes, helmets, repair supplies, and adaptive equipment, so every student has a chance to participate and learn. Every school year, about 1,800 students, or more than 40% of the district, receives age-appropriate on-bike education. We use the state of Minnesota's Walk Bike Fund Bicycle Safety Curriculum. The areas around our school buildings are becoming safer places for families who walk thanks to the state's support in the areas of planning, testing, and installing pedestrian infrastructure improvements. This includes a comprehensive plan for capital investment, an engineering study for the area near an elementary school campus, multiple planned demonstration projects, and an infrastructure grant to fill a sidewalk gap. Another example of state-supported work within the district is modernizing our bike parking. By the end of this project, this spring, we'll have added or replaced about 175 bike parking spaces with high-quality racks with much of the placement guided by the students themselves. I'm happy to report that bike trips to school are increasing. A couple years ago, about 25 students biked to Richfield High School. Now, on a fair weather day, it's closer to 65. I know my time here is limited today, and there's so much more I could tell you about, but what I'd like to say in conclusion is that Minnesota's Safe Routes to School and Active Transportation programs are transforming the community for the better, teaching students lifelong skills, and making it safe to walk and bike to school in Richfield. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Mr. Wislow. Ms. Olson, welcome. Good afternoon, committee members. I'm just going to pull up my slides. My name is Angela Olson. I am the Education Director at the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. I've been an educator in Minneapolis for nearly 20 years. Um, I am also a person who primarily commutes via bicycle and as a pedestrian. So. So. I cannot adequately express the impact of investing in safe routes to school programs and infrastructure. As you'll see here on this slide, a nationwide study of several schools found that implementing um, walking and biking education and encouragement increased bicycle riding by 25%. There was an 18% increase in walking and biking after just infrastructure and a 31% increase in walking and bicycling with combined infrastructure and non-infrastructure related programs. You probably know that physically active children are healthier, happier, and more focused learners while in school. About 10 years ago, the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota worked with Blue Cross Blue Shield, the Center for Prevention, MnDOT, and a focus group of a steering committee to develop our elementary school safety curriculum, Walk Bike Fun. Since then, we have been contracted with MnDOT to implement the curriculum with funding from the Safe Routes to School program. Walk Bike Fun is a comprehensive safety curriculum where Minnesota students learn how to be safe, confident, and effective walkers and bikers. Our curriculum training program teaches educa educators effective ways to deliver these important lessons to their students. To date, we have estimated that we have trained over 1,000 educators across the state, and yearly they are reaching about 100,000 students. And on this slide here, you'll see some of the objectives of this program. With Safe Routes funding, we have been able to respond to and adjust the needs of schools participating in the Walk Bike Fund program. Most notably, we were able to recently um, expand our curriculum from 12 lessons to 24 lessons. So 12 lessons of walking and pedestrian materials and 12 lessons of cycling material, and that's for grades K through eight. A 
Along with the curriculum itself, our teacher training program, we are also able to provide hands-on technical assistance, including access to bike fleets, adaptive equipment, hands-on assistance, and educational materials. All of our teaching training, teacher training sessions are free of charge, and participating districts receive stipends to offset the costs of substitute teachers. Appropriating funds for safe routes is imperative for this program to grow. More infrastructure, more access to curriculum, more hands-on assistance, more flexibility in program and implementation, all of these things will mean that more students are biking, walking, and rolling to and from school in their communities and neighborhoods, and there will be more students who are experiencing increased health, learning capacity, and independence. Thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions about Bike MN's education programming. Great, thanks so much. Appreciate the information. Um, I'll call up uh, Kenneth Littleton, Kirby Beck, and Patrick Hollister. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee. Hello, uh, hello, Mr. Chair. Hello, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kenneth Littleton. I'm the owner of Venture North Bike Shop located in uh, North Minneapolis. I purchased the bike shop last year from an organization called um, Redeemer Center for Life. Redeemer Center for Life is a nonprofit organization that founded Venture North Bikes in 2011 uh, with the intention to provide bicycle services to the North Minneapolis community. Um, uh, the, the goal is also to employ and train young people to provide bicycle uh, bikes to the community at affordable prices. I have a similar vision. Uh, the vision of the bike shop is to be able to uh, have programs in this bike shop. We're the only bike shop in North Minneapolis, Robbinsdale, Crystal, New Hope, or Golden Valley. Uh, we're also the only African-American owned bike shop in the state of Minnesota. Um, our programs that uh, we would like to continue with is the open shop program where adults from the community can bring their bicycles in. Uh, use our tools and equipment to uh, work on their bikes in our in our shop. Also, uh, uh, build a bike program for middle school and high school students that want to learn how to put a bike together uh, from the frame up. Um, these types of programs are not possible with some type of public and or private support. Uh, right now, uh, one of our sources of income is a partnership a partnership with the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota to provide uh, used bicycles for their adult learn to ride program uh, that is uh, partially funded by the Metropolitan Council. Um, <clears throat> increased funding for uh, increased funding for biking and walking programs include the adult learn to ride program that the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota has uh, would be a big help to the bike shops to bike shops like mine and others throughout the state that have community focus, focused programs. Uh, my goal is to provide a few, uh, is to provide community residents jobs, but more importantly provide many of them with bicycles and the knowledge and training uh, that they will use um, as an affordable, healthy, and environmentally friendly uh, way of having transportation. And so um, ultimately, uh, I just wanna say that it's, because of an organization like the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota, that a small, you know, hole-in-the-wall bike shop like mine is able to be able to provide real-life uh, programs for the community that, you know, uh, in turn will actually be able to help with a lot of the, you know, slides and things that I'm seeing here today. So, thank you. Just a quick question: Is the Build a Bike um, program is that popular? It is. It's very popular. Um, you know, Venture North has been around since 2011, so it's, it's got a lot of community support, but I've seen personally, since I purchased that space from our CFL last year in March, that the kids love it. I mean, I, I got a lot of stuff on my, tons of pictures on my social media, and not just a very community-oriented thing. I think we, we've helped probably four or five dozen youth over this, just this last summer, learn how to do things like, you know, change their own flat tire, you know, how to, um, you know, look both ways when the crosswalk sign comes on and they can actually, you know, get off their bike, walk their bike across the street, and just a lot of, a lot of things like that that are very important. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate your work. 
Kirby Beck. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I've got a question. My comments are actually directed more towards your Senate file 912. Would you like me to make them now or come back? Uh, why don't you um, uh, come back and provide testimony? Um, That'd be fine. At that point. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Uh, okay, so uh, Patrick Hollister, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you uh, this afternoon. I'm Patrick Hollister with Partnership for Health. We are the combined public health departments of Becker, Clay, Ottertail, and Wilkin counties in west central Minnesota. We are funded in part by a SHIP grant from the Minnesota Department of Health. SHIP stands for Statewide Health Improvement Partnership. I'm actually a Clay County employee, but through that grant, I serve all four counties. I want to just mention a few uh, things that we've got going on in West Central Minnesota. Uh, this morning, uh, the League of American Bicyclists announced the newest uh, round of bicycle-friendly business designations. And I'm pleased to report that Fergus Falls in Ottertail County had five such businesses. So congratulations to Fergus Falls. You heard it here first. Congratulations. Yep. Uh, awesome. This places uh, Fergus Falls as number seven uh, on the national ranking of the cities with the most bicycle-friendly businesses. We're number seven on this list. Uh, no offense, Senator Dibble, but uh, Minneapolis is only number 13 on this list. Uh, if Minneapolis would, would like some advice on how to move up the ranks, you're welcome to contact me. So we, have, we have perennial bike shop in my neighborhood, which is the best one of all. Excellent. <laughs> so um, Mike Hansen showed you the before and after photos of Battle Lake a moment ago. I happen to have those photos in my presentation also. Uh, but here is me and the mayor of Battle Lake back in 2012 uh, showing off the plan for that road diet or uh, 4 to 3 conversion. So uh, Mike already showed you these photos, but this is the before condition with two driving lanes in each uh, direction. 4 to 3 conversion means we go from two lanes in each direction to one lane in each direction uh, with a center left turn lane. And I actually learned something this afternoon because Mike had statistics on how this has reduced the crashes in Battle Lake and I didn't even know that. So thank you, Mike. Here's a shot that Mike did not have. Uh, this is an aerial uh, of that same uh, after uh, situation in Battle Lake. We've got really nice bump outs there or curb extensions as MnDOT types like to call them. We also uh, created a concept plan for the city of uh, Frazee in conjunction with Frazee for a trail along Highway 87 in Frazee. This is also part of the future Heartland Trail from Park Rapids all the way to Moorhead. We had a ribbon cutting on that trail segment in Frazee last October in conjunction with uh, International Walk to School Day because it goes right past the high school. Uh, and I'm going to wind up here with Pelican Rapids. Uh, Pelican Rapids is a very culturally diverse community in West Ottertail County. Top three languages are English, Spanish, and Somali. This is a flyer for a uh, public input meeting that we had for a concept plan for the reconstruction of 59 and 108 in Pelican Rapids. Here is uh, a photo from one of those meetings. And I'm going to show you, uh, this is the before condition. This is the status quo right now in Pelican Rapids, Highway 59, uh, downtown, the main drag. Uh, after uh, next year, in 2025, it's going to look more or less like that. And thank you to KLJ for that computer-generated image. And I am done. I left uh, 40 copies, uh, paper copies of my presentation on the ledge there with your permission, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Great. We'll uh, ask the pages to grab those and pass them out to the committee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hollister. So um, uh, joining us by Zoom is Cindy Winters. And then uh, I see, uh, are you Reina Lopez? Yes. All right, so uh, Reina Lopez is at the table. Then we'll also invite Helena Howard and Morgan Mackey to come forward. Uh, Ms. Winters, please join yes. us by Zoom. All right, we yes, see you thanks. and we can hear you. P please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for this opportunity to present. My name is Cindy Winters and I live in Mankato and serve on the boards of Bike MN and the Greater Mankato Walk Bike Advocacy Group. As a public health professional, I have worked on active transportation through policy, systems, and environmental change for over 20 years. Through my public health education, I learned and have experienced how community design impacts how we choose to travel around our community. Learning, bicycle, learning to bicycle safely at a young age helps to promote bicycling as a lifelong activity. 
the health benefits of walking and biking are well documented. And starting these habits early in life bodes well for an improved quality of life as we age. Studies show that active transportation not only improves physical health, but also mental health. It also helps to cut down on noise and air pollution, which can be stressors for people. Multiple studies have documented that people who use active transportation to shop spend more money than those who drive. The explosion of e-bikes and e-cargo bikes is a game changer in active transportation. There's a gentleman who rides his e-cargo bike past my house every day, transporting meals from a commercial kitchen to a downtown daycare center. A 2019 report from Rails to Trails Conservancy states that a modest public investment in completing trail and active transportation networks within and between communities could result in an annual economic return of $73.8 billion. I've worked in New Alm on the Heart of New Alm project to make active transportation safer and easier to, to access to help improve heart health. A Safe Lots of School team worked with the city and schools to provide the Walk Bike Fun curriculum, mapped safe walking and bicycling routes to school, and popular community locations. We've implemented traffic calming measures such as a mid block pedestrian island, bump outs, and roundabouts along these routes. While New Alm has made a lot of strides in improving the infrastructure and providing education, there's still a lot of work to be done. So I urge you to support the work that this um, upcoming bill is, it promotes so that the work can continue in New Alm and other small communities. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Ms. Winters. Uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Lopez. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Reina Lopez. I'm a co-captain of Latinos in BC, Minnesota. Our mission is to go out, learn about the place where we live, and invite our community to be part of the place where we all call home. I'm a board member of Bicycle Alliance Minnesota, looking for more people use a bike and walk as a recreational sport and transportation. As a cyclist passionate about education, I believe that education is the first tool to be safe and responsibly cyclist. Adding cyclist classes to the basic, educa basic education curriculum is necessary and an excellent strategy to educate the new generation on how to walk and use the bicycle as a safe transport because it's important to remember bicyclists have the same rights and responsibilities as the driver of other vehicles. It is important to adults and kids to have the opportunity to learn how to ride and share information about cycling education. Exist different programs to learn how to be safe on the street. As a LCI, I have the opportunity to learn how uh, and now to share how to ride safe and how to be responsible pedestrian, cyclist, and a driver. And you can find more program with Bike Alliance Minnesota. Climate change is happening, and we can't avoid talking and do something about it. Electric car is a good alternative as a perfect dream in the future, but it's something expensive, something just a small part of our society can afford. Cycling is a real alternative. As I mentioned before, education is the first tool. However, infrastructure, more trails, road bikes, good connection between places has an equally important role so our people feel safe to walk and use the bicycle and as, and as, posit, and as po, positive consequence, our carbon footprint, footprint will be lower. Being a cyclist, any kind of cyclist, commute, road bike, mountain bike, give you happiness and freedom that give you the opportunity to know a lot of places and make you feel part of the place where we, we, you, you call home. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate the, uh, the testimony. Uh, Helena Howard and then Morgan Mackey. Welcome.
Hi, my name is Helena Howard, and I'm the Education Associate at the Bike Alliance of Minnesota. And I'm here to share with you about our Adult Learn to Ride program, which is a series of classes that teaches adults how to balance, pedal, and ride safely in traffic. Some of our participants tried to learn when they're younger, others didn't grow up with a bike. A majority of our students are immigrants and refugees, and most are women. A participant named Kulthum told us, I grew up in Kenya and we were never taught how to ride a bike. It takes forever to get to my clinicals, my classes, or from point A to B using public transportation, so I got motivated to learn. And Morsal, who is pictured here in the slideshow, says, back home in Afghanistan, women were not allowed to ride bikes. When I ride my bike, I feel free as a human being. I am proud of being a woman, and I feel that biking gives me more confidence and motivation. I love it. We got to know Marcel pretty well as she continued coming to classes as a volunteer. We learned that she had moved to Minnesota as a refugee just a few months before we met her, and that she was biking to work every day. A little history of the program. Adult Learn to Ride classes have been happening in Minneapolis and St. Paul for over 10 years, uh, led by the organization Spokes and then Cycles for Change. When Cycles for Change closed in 2020, they passed on the program to Bike MN, and we're currently funded by the Metropolitan Council with the aim of reducing vehicle miles traveled, pollution, and congestion. This grant expanded the program to 13 cities in the metro area. Last year, we taught 25 Learn to Ride classes, reached 120 students, and distributed about 75 bikes along with locks, helmets, and lights. The classes were in really high demand, so this year our goal is to teach even more classes and distribute over 300 bikes. We partnered with many community organizations, including African Career and Education Resources, African Community Services, St. Paul Public Housing, International Institute, Hoyas Latinas, Ukrainian American Community Center. And our vision is to expand the Adult Learn to Ride program statewide using a train the trainer model, our network of bike MN chapters, and by connecting with local organizations. We know there's a great need for this program because people around the state are asking us if we have classes near them or wondering how they can get involved. We would love to pilot this program in cities we have strong existing partnerships in and with significant immigrant and refugee populations such as Rochester, St. Cloud, and Mankato. More funding for active transportation could allow us to expand this program statewide. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So we have Morgan Mackey up next, and I'll invite Andy Lambert to the table. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Morgan Mackey. I work for Eric's Bike Ward Ski. Thank you for inviting us here to testify, and thank you to Senator Morrison for being the chief author of the bill being heard here today. This week, Eric's is celebrating our 46th year as a Minnesota-based bicycle retailer. From humble beginnings, Eric continued to reinvest in this business and grow the Minnesota brand. Becky, can you just lean a little closer to the microphone? Thanks. We now operate 31 retail locations across eight states, but 15 of those retail locations are in Minnesota, as well as our headquarters and our warehouse facility. We are the largest independently owned bike retailer in the United States. In 2022, we employed 646 people. 387 of those were employed in the state of Minnesota. When investing in properties, such as opening a new location, proximity to trail access, and a city's dedication to improve cycling infrastructure as well as youth cycling safety make a big difference. This is why we can support the amount of retail locations we do in this state. From Woodbury to Eden Prairie, Burnsville to Coon Rapids, St. Cloud, Rochester, cities that dedicate to cycling safety and education create economic opportunity. The rise in popularity of e-bikes has increased ridership, expanded the trade area for bike commuters, and will continue to push the need for improved bicycle infrastructure. E-bikes now account for nearly half the total dollar sales generated by our annual bike sales. This is due to many factors, including getting riders back involved in the sport and attracting other riders who now see bike commuting as being a truly viable long-term transportation option. 
As someone who has commuted by e-bike and on electric bikes, the barriers to this transportation method have shifted from the question of am I physically able to, to can I get to my destination safely? Safe and accessible bicycle infrastructure, along with youth and community education, is critical to our sustained business growth. The economic impact of this legislation on bike-related industry in our state is significant, including many other independent bike retailers, some of which you've heard from today. Minnesota is home to Quality Bicycle Products, a major distributor of bicycle parts and accessories, as well as Park Tool, the largest manufacturer of bicycle tools, with their global headquarters based right here in St. Paul. Not only does continuing to fund bicycle infrastructure and bike safety education bring be benefits like physical and mental well-being and pure joy to the residents of Minnesota, but it also directly impacts the economic opportunities for bicycle industry business in this state. Thank you for the time today. Thank you very much. I should mention uh, I called out perennial bike shop. I have an Eric's in my district too. So <laughs> We love them all. And Eric's is great. I've been there. I love it. So. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Lambert. Good afternoon, Chair Dibble, Vice Chair Morrison, members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Andy Lambert, and I'm the CEO of Cycle Hoop US. We're based here in Minnesota. We design and manufacture bicycle parking and storage equipment. I'm also the board chair for the Bike Alliance of Minnesota and serve as the Ward 2 representative on the Minneapolis Bicycle Advisory Committee. Secure and convenient bicycle parking infrastructure in the active transportation ecosystem is a critical piece of the puzzle. If you own a car, you understand how important secure and convenient parking is. The same is true for those of us who use bikes to get around. Bicycle registration companies in North America estimate that only 20% of all stolen bikes are reported. And last year, there were approximately 190,000 bicycles reported stolen in the US. What's worse is anywhere from 7% 7 to 25% 7 of theft victims never return to cycling. Secure bicycle parking not only helps prevent theft, but it encourages more people to use bikes for transportation and serves those who, either by choice or circumstance, use bikes as an affordable and reliable way to get from A to B. Making places more accommodating for transportation cyclists is good for business, too. Researchers at UC Davis's Institute of Transportation Studies recently published a review of 23 studies titled Economic Impacts on Local Businesses of Investments in Bicycle and Pedestrian Infrastructure, a Review of the Evidence. The studies they reviewed either quantified and compared consumer spending between active travelers and automobile users or quantified an economic impact to local businesses following the installation of bicycle or pedestrian facilities. Taken together, the studies indicate that creating or improving active travel facilities generally has a positive economic impact on retail and food service businesses abutting or within a short distance of those facilities. The state active transportation and federal transportation alternatives programs gives communities the opportunity to apply for funding to implement their entire bicycle and pedestrian plans, both programs and infrastructure. Senator Morrison's bill includes funding for both active transportation and safe routes to school, which could include secure bike parking as well. That critical last piece of someone's journey. I encourage you to support it. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, members, that wraps up our presentation on the subject, which uh, provides us a great uh, segue to Senator Morrison's Senate File 912. Welcome to the committee, uh, Senator Morrison. Please proceed at your pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members, I'm honored to present Senate File 912, the Bill Dooley Bicycle Safety Act. This bill is named in honor of Bill Dooley, who retired early from his job as an insurance industry lobbyist to serve his community as an advocate for social justice, biking, walking, and transit. Sadly, he passed away recently from cancer 
The Star Tribune just published a wonderful tribute to him, and in it, his wife shared that he regarded bicycling as superior transportation that was good for the planet and a rider's health. Unfortunately, as we all well know, the legislature adjourned in May of last year without passing a transportation finance or policy bill. Among other things, that left a great need for funding for active transportation and safe routes to school. Congressman Jim Oberstar championed the inclusion of transportation alternatives and safe routes to school and federal highway funding in the 90s, which was a forward-thinking gift to Minnesota. But that funding has never come close to meeting the demand from all across the state. To help make up that difference, the legislature created the state's safe routes to school and active transportation programs. Safe Routes has received funding and a few bonding bills, and there is a million and a half dollars for it in MnDOT's general fund. Active transportation program was funded once with $5 million in the 2021 transportation budget. MnDOT recently issued an active transportation project RFP for $3.5 million, but they're expecting more than $30 million in requests. The need to fund both programs is great. I'm going to turn it over to my very knowledgeable test and passionate testifier to walk through the bill, but suffice it to say that I think many would find it a very fitting tribute to the legacy of Bill Dooley to pass the Bill Dooley Bicycle Safety Act into law. Thank you, Senator Morrison. All right. Welcome, uh, Mr. Grilly. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you. Uh, Chair Dibble, members of the committee, uh, my name is Dorian Grilly. I'm the Executive Director of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. Thanks again for hearing this bill, and thank you, Senator Morrison, for being the chief author. As noted by Senator Morrison, Article 1 names bill, uh, the bill after Bill Dooley. Uh, he was the hub that many things related to bicycling in Minneapolis, the metropolitan area, and Minnesota revolved around. He was a member of the Minneapolis Bicycle Advisory Committee, the Shared Use Mobility Collaborative, as you heard, the Major Taylor Bicycle Club, and a longtime member of our Board of Directors and the chair of our Legislative Advocacy Committee. On behalf of his family and all of his friends and advocacy partners, thank you for recognizing his efforts by entering his name into the permanent record of the State of Minnesota Legislature. And Mr. Grilly, could I interrupt you for one moment? Uh, yep. Senator Morrison, I think you have a, an author's amendment, the A2. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You are right. All I right. have the, <laughs> the, A1, the A2 author's amendment. All right. And it just makes technical changes. All right. Is it in our packets? It is, right. yeah, sir. All right. It should be at your place. Uh, all right. So Senator Morrison offers the A2 amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Mr. Grilly. All right. Um, article, article 2 of the bill does two things. Uh, it changes may provide student safety education for bicycling and pedestrian to must provide that uh, safety education. And it defines that program. And uh, the amendment you just passed uh, removes the local uh, authority to change speed limits, um, which is going to be part of another bill. The Bicycle Alliance feels that bike education and community engagement are essential investments that are needed to maximize the return on an investment in infrastructure. I think you've heard lots of testimony today that uh, verifies that from all over the state. You heard from Angela Olson that biking and walking safety is already being taught voluntarily in schools across the state. You also heard from Morgan Mackey with Eric's Bike Shop that they agree education is a great investment in the health of our kids. And to that end, Eric's Bike Shop has donated about $100,000 worth of bike fleets and trailers for use during our education programming. Um, we deliver those bike fleets and tra or we deliver those bike fleets um, uh, under contract with MnDOT to a school that's implementing that walk bike fund curriculum uh, for free. I envision the walk bike fund curriculum to be the maximum a school would choose to implement as as uh, this part of the may to must change. Although we have helped many schools expand that also into teaching learn to ride programs. At a minimum, pedestrian safety is already being required as part of bus safety 
training. So I envision that all we would need to be uh, adding is a few minutes of bike safety training, discussing something like a bookmark uh, that the Bicycle Alliance pro also provides for free that simply says on the back, follow the law, be predictable, be aware, be visible, and save your brain. Of course, choose to wear a helmet. The bookmarks are readily available in Hmong, Spanish, Somali, and English, as are several Learn at Home handouts. We'll work with MnDOT and their Safe Routes to School at Steering Committee to edit and condense them into a one-page flyer that could go also go home in backpacks. So that's pretty much it for Article 2. A bookmark, a flyer, and a few minutes of school time once a year would be the minimum. I know there'll be a fiscal impact on that, which you'll uh, discuss later in the committee, uh, uh, later on in the year in the committee. So Article 3 of the bill does a lot of things related to active transportation. Really, I think we deleted Article 3 and Article 4 in the amendment. Nope. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, I take that back. We deleted Section 3 and Section 4, not Article 3. All right, go ahead. Right. My apologies. Thank you. <laughs> in, in Article 2, Section 3 and Section 4. So Article 3 um, has a lot of policy stuff in it. Section 1 requires agencies and governments to cooperate and MnDOT to continue to lead and coordinate that effort by providing active transportation design guidelines, planning assistance, and technical assistance to local units of government. I might add that we think that MnDOT is doing a great job of this now, but Senator Morrison, uh, uh, Senator, Senator Morrison and I agree that we think this sh effort should be recognized in state statute. Section 2 reinserts the Active Transportation Advisory Committee as an advisor on the state bike route system. The committee, which was allowed to sunset a few years ago, will be reauthorized later in the bill, in this bill. Uh, sections 3 and 4 establish the Mississippi River Trail and the Jim Oberstar Route, which is now known as the North Star Bicycle Route, as state bikeways. These routes, which use existing roads and trails, have already been signed and mapped by MnDOT with the help of volunteer planning committees, but not formally recognized as state bike routes. I don't think I need to tell you why we think naming the route from here to Duluth and Grand Marais uh, should be named after Jim Oberstar. Section 5 is about passing a bicycle. It's a simple technical amendment. Um, chapter 169.18. Subdivisions 3 and 5 should say the same thing, but they don't. This resolves that by saying that the passing distance when overtaking bicycles requires at least 3 feet or half the width of a vehicle in both subdivisions. The, cha the change in Section 6 is a national uh, the next change in Section 6 is a national best practice shared with us uh, by the National Conference of State Legislatures and is also recommended by the national bike organizations. It changes the poorly understood and inconsistently, inconsistently enforced bicycles must ride as far to the right as practicable language in the operation of a bicycle statute to as far to the right as is safe, determined by the bicycle operator. Also from NCSL section six, makes it legal for bicyclists to proceed through an intersection from a right-hand turn lane without turning right. I know bicyclists are not often getting ticketed for doing this, and it's a best practice on a busy road with a wide shoulder that periodically becomes a right turn lane. But current law says you must merge into the often high-speed traffic lane and go around the right turn lane. And if you don't, and you get hit by someone turning left, it's your fault. I don't think we should penalize a bicyclist for following a widely rec recognized best practice. Section 7 is the stop as yield for bicycles, also referred to as the Idaho stop. This language also came from S NCSL in its law in 12 other states. We think it is a best practice and will actually help law enforcement decide when to stop a bicyclist requires a bicyclist to slow and yield, but not completely stop if there's nobody to yield to. We don't support bicyclists blowing, blowing through stop signs, and I don't think this will authorize that. Section 8 authorizes 
reauthorizes the MnDOT Active Transportation Advisory Committee that was allowed to sunset a couple years ago. The expense will be minimal given that MnDOT already uses a couple volunteer advisory committees for this purpose and that we are now all accustomed to zooming around the state in two dimensions and meeting that way. Section 9 requires the first 500,000 appropriated for active transportation to be spent to continue the development, maintenance, and implementation of active transportation safety education for youth. As I previously stated, I think the return on investment in education is very, very high. Infrastructure costs millions of dollars. Educating people how to use the infrastructure that exists in their communities right now costs an order of, magnit an order of magnitude less. So Article 4 appropriates $10 million a year for safe routes to school and $25 million a year for active transportation as an ongoing appropriation in the state general fund. As previously noted, the need is great uh, and there is demand for this throughout the state. This is done with the intention of funding much of the match for the federal transportation alternative, making, uh, making applying for these uh, uh, grant programs more affordable to small communities all over Minnesota. So I believe you know, doing this will increase not only infrastructure investment, but that all important program investment that has been talked about by many of our uh, uh, speakers today. MnDOT recently issued an RFP for active transportation and they are expecting proposals, as Senator Morrison said, that add up to 10 times what they have available. To me, that means MnDOT, the Statewide Health Improvement Partnership, schools, the Bicycle Alliance, and many, other many others have done a great job helping communities statewide understand the value of these investments in active transportation and safe routes to school that we're asking the legislature to make. I attended your hearings on climate and transportation equity. Uh, the Bicycle Alliance realizes that biking and walking are not the only solutions to those problems, but as you heard from the speakers today uh, and in the other hearings, there's little doubt that the return on investment will be high. So thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Grilly, and I recall that uh, um, oh, Mr. Beck. Yes, Mr. Beck is here to testify on Senate File 912. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Kirby Beck. Uh, I've got 40 plus years in bicycling, bicycle education, from school children all the way up to police cyclists. I co-creator of the uh, most frequently used cyclist, police cyclist training program probably in the world, uh, but uh, that includes, tw my experience includes 28 years as a Coon Rapids police officer. I retired in 2005. As I was a police officer, I had a chance to get into our elementary schools for one hour a year to try and teach school children the actually quite complex and cognitively challenging cycle motor skill of riding your bicycle near traffic a whole hour. This bill, thankfully, puts the burden on the schools where it belongs all the way along. Um, it'll, it'll require the schools to get involved. I always thought as I was in those schools that there was better people more qualified to teach children than me, and uh, hopefully this will help that come to pass. Uh, in my past life here, I also was chair of what used to be called the Minnesota State Bicycle Advisory Board, and we got involved in a lot of those things. I was talking to Dorian and... Uh, it was allowed to kind of lapse here about uh, five years ago or something. And it's a, I think it's a beneficial thing for the, the state to get back involved in, in coordinating with the, uh, with the different uh, agencies and departments within the state. Uh, currently, I, for about 18 years, I've been working as a bicycling safety standard of care consultant. In other words, I'm an expert witness. When a uh, serious crash involving ser uh, really serious injury or fatality uh, involves a case, a, a civil case, I get involved. So far, I'm running 100% 
whether I'm representing the plaintiff or I'm representing the defense, not one person involved in those serious cases has ever attended any sort of comprehensive cyclist training. We need to get a start on teaching these people how to ride a bike in and around traffic. I'm working a case right now where cyclists who have five, six, seven, eight thousand miles a year don't know how to cross a diagonal railroad track and are getting seriously injured. Ask them if they've ever had training. No, we kind of teach ourselves. Well, they're not doing a very good job. Anyway, um, when we train bicyclists, especially police cyclists, to ride in traffic, we teach them to ride like they're driving a car. And there's some wonderful changes in this law that enable them to do that, especially getting rid of that language, that confusing language as far to the right as practicable. Nobody knows what it means. A lot of people think it means that a bike has to ride to the right so a car has room to pass them. That's not what it means. If you read the original law, the exceptions to that are three times longer than the sentence itself. This just formalizes getting rid of that confusing language. I do, however, have one, one problem with the law, and it starts in about 9.1. It would be what he called the Idaho stop law. It hasn't been around that long, and I'm not sure if it's a good idea safety-wise. The section that talks about stop signs, basically, well, the Idaho stop law amongst the cyclists I've talked to is described as this. Well, that's the one where the stop sign is turned into a yield sign and a red light is turned into a stop sign where I get to go when I can, whether the light's green or not. Well, I know that the language doesn't say that, but that's how it's going to be understood and that's what's going to happen. And I'm concerned about that because as somebody that's been training school children for a long, long time, I'm aware of some studies and some of the uh, issues that children have around traffic. And I think we need to consider that when we... Uh, Look at this law. Okay, Mr. Beck, uh, we need to wrap up. We have a lot more bills on the agenda. All right, so. I got five things about children. Children are easily distracted. They can only focus on one thing at a time. They don't understand bike laws. Stop signs aren't going to work. Stop lights aren't going to work for them. They have an undeveloped sense of danger and assume that grown-ups are watching out for them. On that 40-mile-an-hour road that we're talking about in those slides, that's not going to work. They don't have the ability to judge closing speeds. They don't know if that car that they're looking for, if they look for it, is coming at 10 or 40 miles an hour. For the sake of our children, that Idaho stop law in Minnesota is not yet a good idea. We don't have enough research on it, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right, members, uh, questions for, uh, Sen for Senator Morrison. Questions, discussion, or amendments? Senator Howe. Thank you, Chair Dibble, and good to see you again. Uh, uh, I carried a version of this bill, but not this bill. But I, I guess my question, I've got a question when, with regards to line 4.22 and to 4.24, where you take out, on a trunk highway, you take out the consent of the Commissioner of Transportation. Sen Senator Howe, that section was deleted in the amendment. Section 3 in the uh, A2 amendment uh, and Section 4. So Section 3 starting at 4.16 was deleted, and then the next section, Section 4, was deleted. Well, thank you. Then I'll go to a, a the, I, I'll just say that I, I actually agree with the, uh, with the testifier with regards to the stopping requirements. I actually believe that if this thing says stop, you should stop, and I think that would make it much more I think that would make it easier for a law enforcement agency to actually say that if you didn't stop, you didn't stop. And it's kind of hard to say when somebody pulls out, I think it's safer because there's many times folks are coming at a high rate of speed and you may miss somebody looking to your left or looking to your right and pull right out in front of someone. So, and when you're going a bicycle against a car or a truck, the odds are not in your favor. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, members? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, 
Uh, just a couple questions. Uh, again, you know, we, we keep hearing from our school districts about unfunded mandates and, and now we're requiring school districts. So that's a little bit of a concern because I, I do keep hearing that from my school districts and I, to my understanding, reading through the bill, we're basically mandating our school districts to give training. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Uh, Mr. Chair, S Senator. Senator, Senator Mr. Grilly, please yeah. wait until I call on you before oh, okay. you speak. Sorry. All right, Mr. Grilly, go ahead. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Jacinth. Jasinski, yes, that is correct, but I might add that your school district is already doing more than the minimum requirement in this bill uh, in teaching the walk bike fund curriculum. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and then another another question. I'll just go through a couple of them here. Um, I know Senator Newman was always concerned about uh, the, the bikeways and, and the use of trunk highway funds. So by redesignating these uh, two. Are we going to be, is the plan to re use trunk highway funds to maintain these uh, bikeways? Uh, Senator Morrison or Mr. Grilly? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, um, that, that is hard to say. You know, it depends on uh, whether you define, you know, a shoulder as a bike route uh, or whether the shoulder is part of the roadway. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And then following up again, I, I would have concerns over the stopping as well. I think Senator uh, Howe had that as well, rolling through a stop sign. I don't know if rolling through a stop sign would be uh, best practice for a car. I, I know Colonel Langer's there. I don't think they'd say it's great to roll through a stop sign. I think by actually stopping, uh, it actually makes it much more safety and easy for law enforcement to actually give a ticket versus making that judgment call. So. I would be concerned about that as well. And then um, the bicycle for passing, a bicycle must give an audible signal. So could someone give me an example of what that audible signal would be? Mr. Grilly. Or uh, Ms. Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Jasinski, it could be on your left or a bell. Okay. Just those, and those aren't designated. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. So, so we're not designating what the language is, we're just saying an audible. Um, so again, that's some confusion, and, and it says something about the, the distance, a safe distance before somewhere I read about that. So what would that distance be before that audible signal would be given? Mr. Grilling. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, I, that has not been defined. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Uh, and Senator Jasinski, this bill is going to E12, um, so they can have that discussion about um, implications for schools and school districts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Anything further, members? All right. Uh, Senator Morrison, do you have a motion? So um, I do. It, at some point, this, this is going to go on a little path, and somehow or another, we're going to get this back or get it into an omnibus bill. We don't know exactly, but it does need to go to E12 because of the school uh, requirements for schools. So. so, Mr. Chair, for now, I move that uh, House File 912 as amended be passed. Be passed and re referred to the, edu the Education Policy Committee. All right. Uh, anything further, members? All right. With that, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Congratulations, Senator Morrison. All right. I'm going to uh, jump over my bill for the time being. Sorry, I know folks are here to testify to it. We'll get to it. Um, but um, Senator Dreheim has been waiting for a while, and Senator Housley has a bill as well. So. Out of courtesy to Senator Dreheim, um, we will call him forward to present his two bills. I'm hoping items three, four, five, and six go quickly. We'll see. So that we can get to item seven in time for adjournment, because we do have to adjourn at five o'clock, members. Senator Dreheim, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Dibble, and, and thanks for uh, moving me up. Uh, I, I did learn a lot about bicycling while waiting, so I, I do appreciate that. Um, Chair, we're doing Senate File 241 first, yeah, correct? Yes, okay. Senate File 241. Thank you. Uh, if I could, Chair, then start on my... Go ahead. Okay, yep, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, members, I, I did ask uh, the pages to hand out a flyer um, of an article on stop arms 
um, and what I was thinking probably four years ago um, when I first drafted or started drafting this bill, um, we hear all these stories, and uh, you know we we have uh, Department of Safety, uh, excuse me, Public Safety here, and I'm sure they could elaborate on it. But I, I have a news release from a couple years ago showing that over 4,600 violations were given out for stop arm infringements over the last five years. And what can we do uh, as legislators to keep our kids safe when we send them off to school? And in my area, uh, I have 20 different school districts in my district. I have a lot of geographic area, a lot of people ride buses. There's a lot of rural routes for the buses. Uh, a lot of kids spend a lot of time on those buses, a lot of distance to cover. So what can we do without having that unfunded mandate that Senator Jasinski mentioned on the last bill to try to steer our state in what I believe is the right direction to protect our kids getting on and off school buses? So my proposal would be to have some type of arm, and I'm not endorsing any company. Um, there are two companies that have similar products, one out of Canada um, and one out of the United States, that have a similar type product as you see in that picture. Um, they're federally approved. I, I should also mem uh, mention members that um, I have just had conversation with the state troopers on and uh, Department of Public Safety on some tightening that we should probably put on here on the definition of the arm. It was also recommended to me, members, that we have two stop arms. So you have a short stop arm that they exist currently uh, use that's about 18 inches out, the whole stop sign that pops out. And then a second one, which is my recommendation, the six-foot arm that comes out. And why they suggested that is because of, in some metropolitan areas where maybe the plowing doesn't get done and the roads get pretty narrow, they wouldn't be able to extend that six-foot arm out on some of the streets that they're on. Um, the rate of the arm extending out is... The, the normal stop sign you see now takes about two seconds from the data I read. The big arm would take about four seconds to come out. There are shear pins on that arm that would snap um, or bend. Um, so there would be some give there if it would get hit. Um, I could go on and on. I have a whole bunch of data here, uh, Chair Dibble. I don't know how deep you want to go. I, I just wanted to make sure that you were aware. I think we'd need to tighten up the length of the arm a little bit, and I'll work with you if if you so choose, and uh, Department of Public Safety and the state troopers to Great. craft uh, an amendment at the All right. further Very proceedings. Great. Thanks. Yeah, we definitely don't want you to go on and on. We've got a lot more to get through. Yeah. Um, so we are going, and it looks like I'm getting a little thumbs up, so the agency looks like it's ready to work with you to refine the bill a little bit. So we're going we're to keep the bill over if that's agreeable to you um, and uh, revisit this conversation in, at some point in the not-too-distant future. All right, so we will lay Senate File 241 over for possible uh, inclusion and future consideration. Senator Dreheim, uh, why don't we turn to Senate, two, Senate File 243. Thank you, Chair, um, and, and thank you, members. The, the, pretty straightforward. This is a school bus safety campaign uh, that I would suggest that we put out at the beginning of the school year to remind drivers um, about our precious cargo, our kids. Uh, pretty straightforward. It is scalable, Chair, um, as you work through your budget process. Um, but I, I just feel that we need to uh, probably get the word out a little bit more. On uh, you, you watch those videos and all the news have have had news stories about the videos uh, of people not stopping. It, it breaks your heart every time you see it. Um, so this just helps with that effort, and I appreciate your time. Great, thank you. Questions, members, on either of these two bills. All right, thank you. We will lay Senate File 243 over. 
for possible inclusion in future consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience and waiting to, for these bills to come up. Senator Housley, welcome. Thank you. I'll be quick. All right. Senator Housley brings us Senate File 976, and I am informed you have an author's amendment. Oh, I do. I have a delete all amendment, Mr. Chair. All right. And the delete all amendment is just to get it in the shape that I would like it. Okay. Um, so it's, it's two amendments? All right. Oh, just one. Okay. Um, Senator Jasinski, would you like to move Mr. the Mr. I'd move the A1 amendment. Senator Jasinski moves the A1 amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Senator Housley. Please Thank proceed. you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate File 976 addresses keeping our kids safe when taking the bus to school by installing stop arm cameras. Who knew that there was going to be two stop arm camera or, uh, bills today? No parent should have to worry about getting their child to school, especially um, getting on and off the bus. Um, it is a, an increasing problem, as Senator Drayheim just said. Uh, in the last biennium, the legislature passed $14 million in funding to equip school buses across the state with the stop arm cameras. That grant program is well underway and it's working um, in cooperation, the school districts with DPS and the Office of Traffic Safety. They've equipped 7,000 of our 12,000 school buses, but we need to fi finish the job to make sure all of the children in Minnesota are safe. Um, the base appropriation is $12 million with an additional 188000 to administer the grants over two years. And I do have Scott McMahon of Flaherty Hood if, there, if you want further details or if you're just good with that. Um, Mr. McMahon, do you have <laughs> compelling additional information to share with us? <laughs> You know, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, sure. thank you for the opportunity. Please introduce I, yourself. I can just add a few comments here. Uh, Scott McMahon the third in Hood here on behalf of the Minnesota School Bus Operators Association. Um, for context, the reason the stop arm cameras are so critically important is under Minnesota state law, when a bus driver views a stop arm violation, they can, as an enforcement agent, uh, report to uh, the local police department, uh, state patrol or sheriff, whoever has jurisdiction, of that particular road, uh, identify the vehicle, license plate, make, model, whatever they can share. And with that evidence, uh, the state patrol, sheriffs, or police department can cite the owner of that vehicle. The challenge that we have is when that happens, uh, more often than not, it becomes a he said versus he said situation. Uh, either they're not cited, or they're not charged, or they're not convicted. When video is included as well as that bus driver providing testimony as to what happened, conviction can happen. And in fact, I just received a, an email from one of our operators uh, moments ago that he was talking with his local police department and they said that it's a slam dunk situation. 100% of the time that they have had video, the driver has basically confessed to uh, passing that school bus, has taken the citation, uh, and we've gotten the process moved forward. Each year, uh, the State Patrol conducts a survey in April uh, and asks bus drivers to report how many stop arm violations they uh, encountered on that day. Last year, we had over 1,000. There are 170 school years in the state of Minnesota every day. So think about 1,000 stop arm violations every single school year. When we can get cameras on the buses, we can convict, we can change behavior. Um, with the grant that we've had so far, we have equipped about 7,000 of our 12,000 yellow buses with cameras. We have about 5,000 left to go. The great thing about this is when we replace those buses, we can take the cameras off the bus and put them on the, on the new bus. So they're transferable. It's a long-term investment. Um, I'm not going to go through the process of sharing videos with you today. Uh, if anybody wants to see them, I can share them with you. But I do want to share one quick story. Um, today is February 8th. Three years ago this Friday, uh, February 10th, uh, a young girl, uh, Mariana Kranz from Wisconsin, was at her bus stop. Uh, the bus had stopped. The stop arm was out. The bus driver had weighed them across. Grandma was taking Mariana and her sister across the street in front of the bus. As they turned around the bus to, on, to go on the right side of the bus uh, to enter the door, a truck coming up behind the bus, didn't realize the bus was there, pulled onto the right side, hit Mariana, and she, she was killed that day. Um, this is what we're trying to make sure doesn't happen in Minnesota. This is the behavior we want to stop. Every time a car passes a stop school bus, there is a child getting on or off that bus. And we need to make sure that in that number of 1,000 stop arm violations a day goes down to zero. And the only way we can do that is through changing behavior. 
And we believe the best way to do that is by enforcement and creating the penalties and, and getting the convictions there so people understand that there are ramifications from their actions. Thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, and thank you for sharing the story. That's really, really important. So, and uh, we, we remember her. Uh, questions, members? All right, um, we will definitely lay this over because it's a budget item, so we need to, we'll need to wrap it into the budget, but I really appreciate you bringing this forward, Senator Housley. So with that. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. What's the uh, bill number? Senate file 976 is laid over for possible inclusion. All right, so members, um, uh, I just got uh, dispensation from all of the great people from the Department of Public Safety who have been waiting through this entire hearing <laughs> that <laughs> they're gonna come back at a future date um, to hear um, the bill that I'm carrying. Um, that'll be next week when we do all these agency bills and hear the agency budget. So we're going to take that off the agenda for today. My apologies. I'm sincerely sorry. Our fault. We didn't. We tried to pack this agenda, and uh, and uh, just weren't able to get through it all. So with that, we'll bring Senator Bolden forward because we do have a few sections in a very big bill um, that pertain to uh, matters that are within this committee's jurisdiction. Um, and we need to hear this bill and, and move it back to the floor so that it can make its next stop. I don't even know what that is, but we want to keep this bill moving along. And so, um, Council, if you could um, draw our attention to the bill and the sections that are within our committee's jurisdiction. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, the section within jurisdiction of this committee is... Oh, and members, we're looking at uh, the first engrossment, um, which was... Um, not in your original packet, so it was handed out uh, during, um, during committee. So um, please make sure you're looking at the first engrossment. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. It's um, Article 1, Section 8. It's on page 5. Um, I would say Subdivision 4 on page 7 is probably outside of the jurisdiction of this committee because it has to do with human services. All right. So, um, Senator Bolden, if you could please... Um, presents your testimony or your presentation on uh, uh, Article 1, Section 8, page 5, which has to do with automatic voter registration, and I believe it has some implications for um, Department of Public Safety uh, services with respect to driver and vehicle services. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. I'm grateful to be here this afternoon to present a portion of Senate File 3. Uh, Senate File 3 is a comprehensive democracy bill that defends, strengthens, and modernizes Minnesota's best traditions of voter participation, of sound elections and trusted local elections officials, transparency in government, and grassroots campaigns with voter and local donor support. Uh, this is a package of common sense solutions that uh, rests on the premise that our state works best when Minnesotans' voices are at the center of our democracy. And all Minnesotans benefit, black, brown, indigenous, white, metro, greater Minnesota, rich, poor, Democrats, Republicans, independent, and those with no party at all. We all benefit when Minnesota voters, not corporations or national forces, are at the center of our democratic process. So we've certainly seen our democracy tested in the last few years. We have a rising climate of disinformation and rhetoric and fears of intimidation. Threats and intimidation of voters and elections officials has been on the rise across the country. And uh, we just passed the two year anniversary of the deadly insurrection and attack on our capital. So the dangerous consequences um, of the rise of disinformation and harassment targeting our elections. <laughs> Um, so this bill responds to the urgent and overdue with reforms to make our system more accessible to Minnesotans uh, in a few ways, but uh, in uh, pursuant to your committee and your jurisdiction, I will focus on secure automatic voter registration, which would um, allow, it turns our opt-in system to an opt-out system. So when folks go to renew their driver's license, for instance, and they are providing the necessary information um, for uh, voter registration that they are automatically, uh, their information is automatically updated. Um, it does not change the um, requirements or the qualifications for voting. Uh, it simply changes the system, uh, as I said, from an opt-in to an opt-out system, um, allowing for um, a smooth transition of information. Um, there are checks and balances in place, which we will uh, speak to. Um, and so it really allows for more folks to be um, easily uh, registered to vote. I also will note if um, 
it will most likely in other states where this has been implemented, which is red states, blue states, purple states, uh, many other states have impl implemented this, they see often a marked decrease in same day um, or election day registration because it is happening beforehand. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chair, in closing, uh, this is a critical moment for our democracy. When democracy was squarely on the ballot in 2022, Minnesotans of every race, generation, region, and background turned out to not just cast their vote, but to protect it. And voters sent a powerful message. Uh, they reject extremism and efforts to undermine our democracy. They want us to take action to protect democracy and ensure that all people have a say in the decisions that impact their lives. And that secure automatic voter registration is one piece um, of that puzzle and one way to do that. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a few testifiers, um, and uh, I will call them forward. Uh, we have uh, Sean Lim. I'll call I'll call folks forward like two at a time. Uh, Sean Lim and Leota Goodney. And if if we could please uh, um, testify only to the uh, automatic voter registration element of the bill, that would be most appreciated. And. We have 10 minutes to try to get through this. I don't know if that means we're going to get through it with the debate. If not, we're going to um, come back at 6 because we have, uh, we have a caucus that we have to attend. So we'll come back at 6 o'clock, members, if we don't get through this in 10 minutes. All right. Welcome. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Dibble, Senator Bolden, and committee members for having me again. My name is Sean Lim. My pronouns are he, him, and I am a community organizer and the program director at the Minnesota Youth Collective. We build the political power of young people across the state of Minnesota. Uh, in my eight years of organizing, uh, since I was 15, I've personally registered hundreds of young people to vote here in Minnesota. And today, I would like to share a story from past election day, Tuesday, November 8th, 2022. Starting at around 5 p.m., a lengthy line started forming at the Grace University Lutheran Church polling place, the location for the Superblock dorm cluster at the University of Minnesota campus, which wrapped around the inside of the church twice over with hundreds and hundreds of unregistered students. This was a line specifically for people who are not registered to register same day, many of whom were voting for the very first time. Inside the church, it was very hot and people were dehydrated and hungry, and this scenario could have easily been prevented and should not happen again at any polling place in the state of Minnesota in any subsequent election. I'm very grateful that the state of Minnesota has same day voter registration, but this multi our long line occurred because of outdated voter registration. People lived on campus, but that information was not reflected in our state's system. Passing SF3 and automatic voter registration would effectively solve this problem. I am a strong proponent of AVR because it would save the state a lot of money time and invaluable resources over time, ensuring a robust and more accessible uh, democracy. AVR would save the time and energy of our election judges and staffers, and also reduce long lines that we have in these densely populated neighborhoods in the Twin Cities Metro. There are countless benefits to AVR. The data within the system is uh, accurate, verified, and up-to-date, and every single time a voter in the, in the state of Minnesota interacts with any government agency like the DPS, DMV, um, DVS, that information is updated to reflect any address or name changes uh, when they present document documents confirming their citizenship status. That makes AVR safe, efficient, and seamless, and no additional action is required on uh, the part of the voter, on behalf of the voter. So this is great, of course, for the tens of thousands of college students and renters that we have engaged with um, who are busy, highly mobile, and move annually. Many aren't aware that they might need to bring certain uh, physical proof of residence or identification to update their voter registration. A lot of the times their permits and IDs reflect their parents' home address. Um, and to update all this informa information in person, last minute, day of, tax on time, and creates long lines. So I urge you all to support SF3 th this session and protect our democracy by expanding it, paving the way to a more representative electorate. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, Ms. Goodney. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Leota Goodney. I am a retired CPA and a semi-retired small business owner in Northfield, and I'm a leader with Isaiah. I am very much in favor of automatic voter registration as laid out in SF3. I continue to serve a few elderly and disabled clients, helping them with their finances and with various aspects of managing their lives. I have a disabled client who got married since the last election. She went down to the local DMV with her birth certificate, marriage certificate, and so forth, and got her revised Minnesota identification card. Then the elections came along and she went to vote in person, as she likes to do, though it is something of a process. She found that she needed to re-register to vote, and of course she did not have the proper documents with her. A trip back to her apartment and back to the polls was more than was possible for her that day. So she ended up not voting and was quite upset about it. This is the kind of situation where automatic voter registration would have been very helpful. We in the able-bodied community forget how difficult an extra trip can be. It is important that every eligible citizen have, access to, have easy access to voting and making voter registration automatic when people interact with the Minnesota government makes great sense. Please support this bill for automatic voter registration. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, Paul Huffman and Sarah Birchinger. Uh, thank you, Chair Dibble and uh, committee members. I'm Paul Huff, and I'm testifying today uh, in favor of automatic voter registration, Senate File 3. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I've been a head election judge over the last three years in four different precincts and uh, vastly different areas. Uh, I am also a member of the Board of Directors and a Voter Service Chair of League of Women Voters Minnesota. Uh, briefly, uh, my perspective, based on having seen anywhere from 3 to 10 percent of voters on Election Day use Election Day registration, is that automatic voter registration will be a significant improvement in our ability to unburden election judges and help voters by being better prepared to vote when they're ready on Election Day. Uh, automating this process will reduce the workload on county election officials by manually entering forms. It also reduces the potential for manual data entry errors, which both challenge election judges and also create some potential for concern on integrity of voter rolls. Um, while election judges really enjoy doing election day registration, it's a complex and sometimes time-consuming process. The thing we most often use to do election registration is driver's licenses. And it's the driver's license we're talking about in this context to support automatic voter registration. So this uses an existing process uh, to register. It's been in place for many years. It's been highly reliable. It helps the voters. It helps us as election judges. Um, and will provide greater confidence in security elections. So I encourage you to support uh, automatic voter registration in House File 3. Thank you. Excuse me, Senate File 3. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, given word from upstairs that we can be a little late to our, our five o'clock, so we got a little more time here. Um, I don't see Ms. Birchinger. Um, we have um, Sarah Gonski but, um, on, on Zoom, but I understand she's available for uh, questions and, uh, and phone a friend uh, uh, duties, so, so um, not to call on for, for testimony. So with that, members, uh, we will go to questions and discussion and amendments. Senator Howell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, I guess I have some concerns. I, I see that uh, the 16-year-old, when they register, when they get their driver's license, they get automatically registered in the system, but it doesn't populate the voter registration rolls until they turn 18. The question is, is there, they've got the option to, well, the question I have is what happens if they move in that two years? Uh, from my understanding, especially in a lot of my area, we have mail-in ballots where when that registration pops into the voter rolls, they're automatically going to get sent a ballot. If the person doesn't live there, my concern is that ballot goes elsewhere, and if the person moves out of state, that 
ballot could be used, could it not, by somebody that wanted to defraud the system? I mean, my concern is, is how does that get updated? I mean, and if they, if they, I, my concern, I also see in here someplace, and I don't have it right in my hand, but can they also check the box for automatic uh, mail or absentee ballot permanent? Is that also not in that system? Senator Bolden. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, thank you for the question. So a, a, a few questions in there, so I'll, I'll try to uh, answer. Um, so in terms of the 16 and 17, so another piece of Senate File 3 is the pre-registration for 16 and 17-year-olds. And so that allows 16 and 17-year-olds to pre-register. They are not, they go on a separate list, so they're not actually registered until they turn 18. Um, in terms of, so if it would be a combination of uh, a 16 or 17 year old who has pre-registered and they have requested an absentee ballot, um, I would say that would um, fall under the same circumstances as anyone else who would have moved in the time between they request a ballot and it arrives at their house. N ballots, uh, absentee ballots cannot be not anybody can just use a, a ballot and say that they're somebody else. And so when you um, mail in a absentee ballot, you have to provide uh, secure information, either um, you know the last four of your um, social security number or um, I'm losing the other piece of information. Uh, but there's secure information that you have to provide with that. So, so somebody couldn't use somebody else's ballot, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and I'm, uh, we have resources from Secretary of State's office who can correct me if I'm wrong on that piece. Um, and can you remind me the second half of your question? I'm sorry. Well, my, my uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Howe. So uh, I guess if they, uh, you know, the other piece that I, I guess is the mail-in ballot piece because I got is if they're registered, they're also going to mail in a, they're, they're going to automatically get a mail, a ballot mailed to them. There's no, and I, that's my concern, I guess with both the absentee ballot permanent and the mail-in ballot pieces, we're not verifying that, it, there, we, how, did that how does that data get updated if they, if they just move? How does that data get updated so that ballot goes to the right place? Uh, Senator Bolden. Mr. Chair, that is part of actually the beauty of secure automatic uh, voter registration is when they move, they are going to have to update their driver's license. And when they go to update their driver's license, they will provide their new address and that will be updated in the voter registration system. Senator Howell. That's, it. thank you, Mr. Chair. So Senator Bolden, that's if they update their driver's license. But I know many folks that they don't update their driver's license until four years later when they have to get a new driver's license because they don't want to have to pay that update fee, that renewal fee. So they leave it there. So I just, I got a concerns about that process when, and it, and I, it brings up to mind when, when, the, uh, when the testifier was talking about college students. Uh, that's another perfect example. This automatic registration, they're going to be registered one place. They want to vote where they go to school, their driver's license puts them someplace else. I, I just, I think there's going to be a lot of ballots being mailed to people where there's nobody there and they're going to be trying to vote elsewhere and they're going to try to register. And I don't see the lines that the testifier talked about getting smaller I think they're still going to be there with a lot of confusion because they are going to be in the voter registration vote rolls, but registered elsewhere doesn't fix the line problem. I could see where something where provisional ballots would help that process because they wouldn't have to, it would be a lot faster. Their ballot would go someplace until that ver information is verified. Uh, we're one of three states that does not have provisional ballots uh, and and I see isn't it and I and I'm you know trying to get caught up but is the absentee ballot permanent absentee ballot piece is that an opt-out 
are they automatically, I seen something here that there was an opt out or maybe it was an opt out after they get their driver's license. Is it within the 20 days they can opt out of being automatically registered? Why wouldn't that be an opt in to get automatically registered? Senator Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question. So I just want to be clear, there's sort of two separate things here. So the, um, the permanent absentee voter uh, is also in the bill, but is sort of a separate provision from the secure automatic uh, voter registration. So those two don't have to go hand in hand. Somebody, you know, it, you don't, you're not automatically um, on the permanent uh, absentee voter list just because you're uh, automatic, you're part of the secure automatic voter registration. So just to be clear about that. Um, so in terms of, um, If I, if I may, Senator Helm. thank you, Chair Dibble. If, I guess the question is, is the, if you go get a driver's license, you're automatically registered, and then you got the notice 20 days, you got 20 days to opt out. Why wouldn't we just have a notice that says you got to opt into the automatic voter registration instead of having another notice and trying to opt out of it 20 days, within 20 days later, otherwise you're automatically in. Why wouldn't we just give that box on the deal where you get your driver's license and say, yeah, I'm gonna wait to vote or register? And why have an opt in instead of an opt out? Senator Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. So that really is sort of the, the purpose of this policy is to change it. What we have now is an opt-in system um, to move it to an opt-out system because it is a smoother transition of, of um, information. Um, it is easier for, for people to, to take advantage of. Um, it brings, it's more inclusive, it brings more people into the system. And yes, people can people can opt out at any time. There's They will get a postcard in the mail um, that, that says you have been registered to vote. If they do not want that, they are are welcome to, to respond to that and opt out of the system. Um, there is a 20-day deadline in there just to have a deadline, but if it is at any point, at any point, somebody could unregister themselves uh, to vote just as they can now. Mr. Chair. Senator Help. Thank you. Uh, so I guess my question is, is when they have, a, when you're a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old, get a, you get a provisional ballot, uh, provisional license and then it changed, you gotta go get a new one when you turn 18, uh, from my understanding, if I'm correct on that. Is it 21? Senator I, I, Jasinski. I, I thought it was when you turned 18 and you could do, is it 21? Mr. Chair, I, I think Can DVS tell us that, I guess? When does that change? I thought it was always 18. Mr. Chair, and Sir Howell, I, I Senator just Senator. have a, a a child who went through, I think at 21, they go from a, a, a portrait style landscape to a landscape style, so they, it, there is a difference. And again, we brought that up before, but I believe that happens at 21, unless someone from DPS can correct me, but it, it should at, at age 21, because of alcohol, tobacco, all those things that you can do, it switches from a, a portrait to a landscape like everybody else's. But under 21, I believe is portrait so that it specifically shows that they're not legal to buy alcohol. I was an antique. I was, a, I was good at 18, so I'm just... Uh... <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, anything further? Or did you, did, was there a question that Senator Bolden needed to respond to? Well, not if, if it doesn't change till 21, then I guess it's a mute point. But I was wondering if it changes at 18 or 21, and if DVS can't tell us over there, it looks like they're all conferring with one another. So... Uh, Director Zhang, right. So uh, we will take uh, this response and then uh, members will have to come back at six because we are starting upstairs. So Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator uh, Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver Vehicle Service Division. Uh, one of the benefit or one of the downfalls of being new, I'm still not familiar with the provisional pieces of this work, but we will definitely get an answer and get it to the committee. All right. Uh, Senator Carlson, uh, we're starting upstairs, so. Okay. Quick one. You're, uh, oh, I think your microphone. Oh, just the uh, soft part. Uh, Senator Bolton, maybe to answer one of the questions that's come up here about uh, uh, the delay between a 16-year-old getting onto the list and 
being uh, confirmed as a registered voter, when does the verification, the address verification com card come out? And if that card is not returned, then that person is no longer, becomes no longer registered or they, they get on the list that they have to re-swear to, uh, uh, to their new address. Senator Bolden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Carlson. So, yes, as I said, the 16 and 17-year-olds, when they are pre-registered, they are on a separate list and don't move to the actual voter registration list until they turn 18, um, and information will be verified at that time. Senator Carlson. Okay, so we are going to recess, um, aim in for six. So I'll confirm that with you, Senator Jasinski, and we'll post it on the... Uh, interwebs. All right.